Thank you for joining us on Student Docs. I'm your host, Carol Adrian. Today, I'm really proud that we have this film to show you. It is called Warrior Class, and it was produced by Villanova University's Social Justice Documentary Program. Every day in this country, 20 American veterans and two American active service members commit suicide. That is 660 suicides every month of the year. When people enlist and train in the military, they undergo strenuous training for expertise in a number of skills and lifestyles that are really unique to the military. When they return to civilian life, it is a tough transition. Some people are never able to get a hold of who am I after the military or to deal with the confusion and pain that comes along with that unsuccessful transition. Many veterans have a hard time asking these questions. So this film, we're going to take a look at what goes on. It's almost a, a two-part thing. What goes on upon their return to the States and trying to fit in with civilian life? And then what happens when they try to find ways to overcome the problems that arise from this attempted uh, transition. So our guest today is Liam Wolf, who is the co-director of Warrior Class. And Liam, I know you want to give some shout outs to your team. And we're also going to put up uh, a URL so that you can see the full one hour documentary, which is so important and I think it really would behoove every American to see this film. The first half of the film, as I said, deals with the problems and the second half with the solutions. So we are going to see a clip in a few minutes about how one veteran, Tim Flynn, found solutions. So Liam, I'm going to ask if you'll please give us a picture of the kind of challenges and heartache that Tim encountered upon his return from active duty. Yeah, yeah. So, so Tim, it's actually Tim Wynn. Um, oh, Tim, Tim Wynn. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, Tim. Tim came back um, after his service. He employed or he deployed in 1999 um, and joined the Marine Corps. He's from Philadelphia. Um, and after enlisting, shortly after 9/11, um, when we had the initial invasion of Iraq in 2003, he went over there and he was one of the first pair of boots uh, to go over as a part of that initial invasion. Um, so therefore, he was one of the first uh, people to come back from that initial invasion. And being that these conflicts um, were sort of new at the time, there wasn't much uh, to know about these specific veterans and the experience that they're going to be going through. Um, so Tim came back and uh, within 72 hours of being sent back to uh, Camp Lejeune, where he was sent back after being in Iraq, uh, he was back in Philadelphia. And he really didn't have much time to process nor any sort of uh, mechanisms to process mm -hmm. what had just happened, what he had just been through. Um, and four days later, unfortunately, he was in he was in a bar fight and he got at, arrested for aggravated assault. And um, he wasn't uh, charged for that, but his luck didn't really last. And and eventually, he he got arrested seven more times. And over the next four years, he spent um, a lot of time dealing with substance abuse, um, in and out of jail and prison, um, and and in that time, really just struggling to find his, uh, you know, way back into civilian life and the purpose that he was really seeking. And as you'll see in the clip, this, this is a man who um, has really found that purpose um, in, uh, you know, overcoming all of the obstacles he had to without many sort of structures in place uh, to really guide him through it. So that that's sort of what, what Tim went through. And the clip gets a little bit into his family. And because of the issues that he was facing, he, he, he missed some time with, with his daughter, who um, he has now mended a relationship with um, in a very beautiful way. And um, I, I, I really hope people um, can see how dedicated Tim is um, as a well-rounded person, as, as uh, a veteran, as someone who's serving his community, as a father and husband. Um, so that's, that's sort of Tim's story to take him to the point 
of um, how am I going to overcome this? I was really struck by he said he lost the first four years of his daughter's life. Very, very sad situation, and unfortunately, not a rare situation. So, so Tim really, when thrown a ball, he ran with it. And he got involved with several different groups in order to just get his balance back. And we're going to take a look at this clip and see what Tim worked on to bring his life in, back into a solid and joyful and family situation. So let's roll the clip. I think back on all the things that I've been through, sort of the emotional roller coaster. I really, it was, you know, sort of through the ringer. And uh, once I got to the Veterans Court, when I came in here as a defendant, that's where I learned to actually deal with the mental health part. That was a game changer for me. My mentor at the time was a guy named Mike Brown who worked at the Department of Behavior Health. He was a veteran and uh, he was there every step of the way. And what I saw in Tim was someone who was genuine about recovery. He couldn't see his daughter anymore and that was very, very painful. And I think that was really the driving force for him. And so then from treatment, he started to have better reactions for moments that would usually trigger you know, massive blow-ups with his anger. He was responding better, and it was actually working. And then he started to hit it like a real true Marine. He, he put every ounce of energy into uh, that recovery. I wound up getting 14 um, charges expunged off my record with the help of the Veterans Treatment Court team here in Philadelphia. And so I got those cleared up. So I still had these convictions on my record. I had to get interviewed by uh, parole officers, people to ex uh, speak on my behalf, and I think I got over 240 letters. When I stepped in front of the actual Board of Pardons in Harrisburg, the Board of Pardons saw that I was a changed individual. I had made some mistakes, and I got five yeses. Then it was up to the governor. Within three months, he signed my pardon, and I am currently without a criminal record. Well, he's just one shining example of how you can be an asset after trauma. He's really grown from that, and now he's sharing that with uh, society. I was a construction worker, man, you know what I mean? And I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. I didn't know nothing about being in an office. Uh, but Mike Brown, in his infinite wisdom, thought, you know, maybe we could use Tim to help more veterans. And he actually called me and he said, listen, we have a position at the Department of Behavior Health as a peer specialist. And I began to come back to this court and help with the veterans who were walking through the door. One of the greatest things I get to do here at the Philadelphia Veterans Court is uh, we go to equine therapy. I've been going up there, I guess, for about three years now. I'm pretty much a cowboy at this point. It's okay. You ready? Come on. I remember when I first came here, there's no way I would be in here with them running around like that. Yeah. Scared to death. She's sort of the, uh, the head honcho here. She, uh, she looks over at everybody else. Right, Teak? Look out for me, don't you? Yeah, it's okay. She lets me kind of know, uh, you know, exactly where I'm at, right? It's different now for me, but I still get, you know, beat down sometimes, and I, I'm able to come here and sort of unwind, relax, and get away from that. One of the things that I have, I keep with me is, uh, yeah, I know this is yours. Is a lock of her hair. So when I'm not here, I kind of take this out. It has sort of a calming effect. It gets me through some bad times, that's for sure. It's definitely, yeah, this is you. <laughs> She's like, I know. It's amazing how much healing power that animals, especially horses, have for veterans because they're so much like us. They're um, full of anxiety. Um, they're prey animals. They move in packs, sort of like a platoon does. Um, so they're very similar to us and they can teach us a lot about what we're going through you know again I'm a city boy I've never been around these horses but it's something that I think I'll do for the rest of my life today I work in this building which I was once a defendant in and I'm, I'm here every single day so this place is special to me because it's where I get to help veterans who are going through the same things that I once went through it's absolutely tremendous what happens here and how these individuals turn their lives around and I get to come here every single day and help the younger version 
or the older version of me that's walking through the door get through this process, and it's a beautiful thing. So you have a guy like Tim Wynn who's doing incredible stuff on his day job in Veterans Court, and now to see what he's doing with the Flyers Warriors. It's an all-veteran team and veterans who are partially disabled or wounded warriors. And hockey's all about teamwork. Hockey's all about that grit, about that warrior ethos. And he is getting after it. And you're coming on the ice, right? It's just very important for the success of veterans to be around other veterans, and that's what the Philadelphia Flyers Warrior Team provides. We're just not playing hockey. We're here to create a community, and we're here to get better as a community. Hockey's just a part of what we're doing. That's what we want going after loose pucks. That's what we want for checking. That's what we want at going after the puck in the corner. Always chasing, always pressure. When they come home, it's like, what do you miss? It's the camaraderie, it's being together, a sense of purpose, if you will. Uh, you gotta move as a unit, you gotta practice as a unit, you gotta sharpen your skills just like you would in the military, and um, that hockey team builds everybody up. We'll stick together. Yeah. So you say you've been miserable lately? Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it gets like that, man. It's just good to get out, clear your mind. Hockey makes it all better, it don't does. it? The Philadelphia Flyers Warriors hockey program. It's not just a team, it's a family. Uh, sometimes disabilities get in the way, but I, I like to try to come if I can be here. Even if I can't skate, I like to support my guys. Wow, Jay's here. How you feeling, bud? I'm all right. I have epilepsy because of my TBI. You don't even feel come on, do you? You just go into a seizure? It's 5 o'clock in the morning. Wow, man. I miss you. I miss Jay or yeah. one. Well, get better, bud. You know we miss you. Yeah. My man. You know, things that we've seen, done, it's uh, nothing can compare out on the civilian world. That's one common bond that we share. I mean, me personally, I didn't know that I needed any sort of help or camaraderie. I thought I just wanted to play hockey and thought it was going to be good for other people. So in my head, I was building this to help other veterans. And it turned out I needed a lot of things a lot more than I realized I did. Staying busy with stuff like this, with guys that have been through the same stuff you have, is priceless. Good job, new guy. Hey, it's your first day here, man. Good job, buddy. I'm Tim. This was my first practice, and it was great. You'll fit in, bud. I'm a player. Met a bunch of these guys. They were awesome dudes. Um, everybody treats you like family here. Okay. It's a good practice. What defined it was our attitude. Keep that in mind. Our attitude is going to define our success. If we listen to that man, things are going to happen. So, so remember that. We actually competed in the Warrior Cup in Las Vegas, and uh, it's our first year in existence, and we won a championship. We're the champs. You got to come through us now. Tim Wynn's one of those folks that is the epitome of a hockey player. He's tough, he's strong, he's smart, but he's selfless. This is Fiona, she's six. Sienna, she's 12. Maeve, she's two. And my wife, Nicole, she tell you I'm still a pain in the ass, but <laughs> I'm not that pain in the ass anymore. I went to go file for custody for my daughter, or, or at least try to see my daughter. And I had a year sober at that point. And uh, we got to the courthouse, and I remember walking down the hallway, and I remember her laying eyes on me and her just, you know, breaking down and, and, and crying. She finally came over to me. She said, I can tell just by looking at you that you're a different person now. This is my little guitar player. She's uh, real into music, and we have a lot in common. You have a preference? Yeah, if I handed her a cassette, she wouldn't even know what to do with it. <laughs> All right, go ahead. You know, I missed the first four years of that. And uh, looking back on it now, I was in no way, shape, or form to be a father at that time. I regret every second of that, but you know, today I'm able to be her dad. I'm able to guide her. Um, 
you know, I, I, I put my wife through hell. I really did. And one of the things that I'll always be grateful for is she never talked bad about me. She never told my daughter, you know, anything negative. She used to tell my daughter that daddy got sick in the war and he was in a hospital. So I'm grateful for that. Liam, would you talk to me a little bit about how you did your research and how you really found the touch points of your story? Yeah, so I, I would say um, a little bit about like how we got to do uh, a project about veterans. Um, as a part of the social justice documentary program, they give us a topic. Um, and we, uh, a group of about 12 to 15 students, get together and we just produce the, the project based on the topic and it was veterans. Um, so therefore, in around um, August, September 2019, uh, we began getting in touch with uh, veterans in the community, so individuals who were willing to give their story and insights into um, their service and their transition. And we also got in touch with um, a bunch of nonprofits as well. Uh, the nonprofit we worked with, Impact Services, we worked with the Greater Philadelphia Veterans Network, um, Shamrock Rains, which was where the uh, the horse farm uh, was, the, the equine therapy that's in, participates in, um, the Philadelphia Flyers Warriors, uh, the Warriors Watch Riders, which is an awesome group. Uh, they It's a group of veterans who um, they greet uh, people coming home at the airport, even at 4 a.m., just to make sure they get an escort back home, just um, to make a big to-do about, about their return home. And actually, uh, one of the main characters uh, of the film, his, her dad is one of the only non-veteran uh, sort of leaders in the, the Warriors uh, Watch Riders uh, National Committee, which is really neat. Um, and then we also so worked with... So supportive of his daughter. That was yes, really a remarkable exchange. She was so lost, and he was there it, for yes. her. Incredible. Just a sincere, sincere guy. Um, and Erica's uh, business, of course, uh, Dub Fitness, her women's only gym, and then Mike Woody's 360 leadership training. Um, there are two other businesses from the main characters that we, we definitely wanted to highlight. Uh, but, but working with the S experts, we were really able to nail down what has changed for veterans over time. Um, so we worked with uh, three primary experts. So we worked with Ralph Galati, who was a, a prisoner of war in the Vietnam War, um, with a, a tremendous story of recognizing his trauma in a way uh, that allowed him to become a pur purposeful uh, community member and a purposeful leader for veterans. Uh, we worked with General Anthony Zinni. Um, he was a former uh, Marine Corps general and a commander of chief in the U.S. Central Command. And then we also worked with Patrick Murphy, who was the first Iraq War veteran uh, to serve in Congress, and he eventually served under Barack Obama as the Under Secretary of War. Um, so with their expert uh, testimony, we were able to sort of track what has happened and and we kind of came, came down to uh, see it as you have a conflict in history, you have a way in which the military corps is formed, and then you have the public opinion that goes along with it. Um, so in World War II, for example, uh, the consensus was clear that we should be there. Uh, it was a, a conflict where, um, from a human rights perspective, we, we had to have um, kind of a say in what was going on, and our public opinion was pretty strong toward it uh, for that. And with that, we had a draft. So um, the public opinion was strong and we also had a draft. So it was kind of entwined into the community, um, the, the sort of, uh, you know, veteran community was very present in that moment. Um, and then we got to Vietnam and public opinion uh, wasn't necessarily there. People didn't support our cause there. Uh, but we still had a draft, and therefore we still had people in every community um, that was connected to this conflict. Um, and then we look to today, which uh, we have been in the conflicts uh, that came out of the post 9-11 um, time uh, for the last two decades, for my entire life practically. And for that reason, um, and for the reason of having a volunteer force that is only comprised of 1% of our population, um, there's an a kind of distance separated between civilians and between veterans. Um, being that it's been 20 years, there's an apathy that is sort of formed toward these conflicts, um, and they're so far removed. Um, so both by time and geography, we have be kind of become distanced from the conflicts, while we also have a volunteer force of 1% of the country. So therefore, it's the difference, yeah. 
So the title warrior class is not referring to a classroom type of learning. It is referring mm -hmm. to a, a, a perceived social class difference. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it's referring to the identity uh, mm -hmm. for sure. And um, that's something that with our three main characters, we really wanted to give a, a broad look into as many different identities as we could. Um, so uh, with Michael Woody, we're, we're looking into what is the experience of the, uh, the black veteran who serves and um, comes home and doesn't necessarily, um, you know, have all of the, uh, I guess, rights that you would expect as someone who, you know, just deserves them, of course. And then you have uh, uh, Erica Webster, who also uh, gives a nice breadth of the, the woman experience in um, the veteran community. Uh, so yes, it's definitely about the individual identities. And in, in going into this project, um, I was definitely forced to learn a lot about, uh, you know, what I thought about the country. Um, because when we started the project in September 2019, um, you know, it was it was in the middle of and kind of proceeding this big reckoning that our country has had in terms of social justice. And um, with this reckoning, I began to, and I, I'm sure other people have, begin to look at the flag a little bit differently. Um, kind of things going on in the country, um, you know, change the way that you think about the country. And, and um, so in doing so, I kind of learned that you need to be able to separate the individuals who are, um, you know, a part of maybe military intervention that you don't agree with. Um, you need to be able to, to separate the warrior from the war and be able to um, kind of really focus on the individual uh, for the often traumatic experience that they're that they're going through. Um, the, the experience of going through training and going abroad and coming back home is incredibly traumatic. So regardless of my attitudes toward um, what the flag has meant abroad, um, this project is really about those individuals and what it means to uh, make that journey. Um, and recently I saw I saw a TED talk. It, it was by Dylan Marin, and it was entitled Empathy is Not Endorsement. And, and that was really a thing that I challenged myself to do, just empathize with these individuals who are doing this incredibly, incredibly um, patriotic thing um, while, while not necessarily endorsing uh, warfare in general. Um, and, and that's another thing that I learned in the experience, um, just something about the, the moment that we're in today, uh, you know, with, uh, Donald Trump being a leader and, and such, this has brought, uh, sort of problems that existed in our country to the surface. Um, and one of those things has been the, the rise of white nationalism and, and white terrorism. And I, I have definitely come to the philosophy that patriotism cannot exist in conditions of nationalism. Um, they are two very separate ideas. And I think because of the sort of uh, siege on the flag that white nationalism has made, it's easy to look at the flag and get those two ideas conflicted. And um, we just wanted to make sure to make a project that was going to be highlighting the patriotism that these incredible, incredible individuals have. Um, the patriotism being the respect for duty, regardless of creed. Um, so, yeah, that was that was definitely something that we we came to a realization about, and I definitely did personally. How did now you spent over a year of intensive work on this film? How did it change you personally or professionally? Did it did it shine a light on anything? You know within you that you were unfamiliar with previously? Yeah, yeah, just, um, I learned so much, just as anybody watching it, I hope does, just so much about the veteran community and what we can do to just be aware of the veteran community. Um, my best friend from uh, back home growing up, uh, his name is Corey Rhino, he's in the Navy right now. Um, so I definitely had that personal link that, and I kept him in mind the whole time, you know, telling a true story uh, that's going to, uh, you know, relate to his experience and the experience of all veterans. Um, and also professionally, I, I really fell in love with the, the form of video production. Um, yeah. So actually right now I'm, I'm in Los Angeles just trying to connect with as many uh, industry professionals as possible. 
Um, and, you know, prior to this project, prior to participating in the social justice documentary program, I didn't really have an intention of, of going into uh, video production. It was, I was more interested in other things like government politics um, and other forms of storytelling, but I, I have really, you know, fallen in love with this and I'm excited to, you know, take the journey to, to find PA work and um, get on set and just learn as much as I can. So it sounds like a wonderful way to fall into video production. And I think video production is going to be very lucky to have you. Um, we have a few more minutes and I wanted to ask if you have any words for somebody thinking about getting into uh, video production or documentary production specifically. Uh, yeah, I, I would just say to, to stay true to storytelling and, and continue to um, just listen and be empathetic. Um, uh, I, I think this whole experience made me better at listening uh, just in uh, an informal sense and in meeting the characters that we uh, that we ended up taking testimony from and, and getting insights from, and also in a formal sense with the actual uh, interacting with those characters to, to create content. Um, so just constantly listening and, and constantly being, um, you know, open to hearing out the experience of others. I also want to say uh, that uh, just something about uh, other people that did the project with me, my co-director, Abby Rivar, all of the shots look so gorgeous because of her incredible cinematography. And then the assistant director, uh, Jack Weidmeyer, the project was not um, possible without him. Um, or uh, Sophia Botini, who was just an awesome, awesome editor um, and uh, assistant in all sort of, sorts of different ways. So definitely wanted to give them a shout out uh, with the time that we had. So. They did a fantastic job. And just as a documentary filmmaker, I was really, really struck by how much different footage is used. And we can see it in the credits of the full film, but... I, I lost count of how many cuts, but it's so skillfully done. And I noticed that you use certain techniques, like the camera pushes in. And after a few minutes, I felt like I was being drawn into the story in an almost physical way. I thought that was a very, very effective uh, thing to do. So uh, I really hope, thank you so much for being with us and sharing this incredible film, Liam. Uh, we are going to put up the URL where you can see the entire uh, warrior class and also um, some access to the nonprofits that supported Tim and other returning veterans. So we hope that you will share this important film and we hope you will join us again on Student Docs. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.